Hello and welcome to the Spinal Cord Injury Forum. I'm Dr. Stephen Burns, Medical Co-Director of the Northwest Regional Spinal Cord Injury System. The forum, the video recordings, and our online media content are made possible by a grant from the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. Tonight we are pleased to have Dr. Chet Moritz, Assistant Professor in the Departments of Rehabilitation Medicine and Physiology and Biophysics at the University of Washington. His presentation is, is titled, Developing Neuroprosthetic Treatments for Spinal Cord Injury. Dr. Moritz. Thanks, Stephen. It's a pleasure to be here. Tonight what I'm hoping to do is give you guys a glimpse of potential future treatments for spinal cord injury or other damage to the nervous system that results in partial or complete paralysis. So I'm going to tell you about some research that we're doing in my lab as well as research going on across the country which is little by little discovering that it might be possible to interface the neurons in the brain or the spinal cord with computer electronics and provide a bridge perhaps that could either replace or restore some level of motor function after injury. And so I use the, the big word neuroprosthetic here. What do I mean by neuroprosthetic? So as I'm sure most of you know, a prosthetic limb or a prosthesis is um, an artificial component that replaces something that's missing. And so for many years, individuals with limb loss have been able to be fitted with, and here example of a transtibial amputee, fitted with a uh, prosthesis, which restores some of the function that's been lost in that limb. And, and currently, these prostheses are so advanced that, that certain individuals, a double amputee, Oscar Pistorius, was actually banned from competing in the Olympics because people thought that he might win. So he was nearly as fast as anyone, uh, even those people who still had their, their legs intact. So certainly we've made a lot of progress in prostheses. What about neuroprostheses? Now a neuroprostheses is something that uh, restores function to a damaged part of the nervous system. And the most successful example to date is the cochlear implant. The cochlear implant is a device that works for individuals with certain types of deafness or hearing loss. There's a little microphone that's worn in a hearing aid behind the ear. And that microphone transduces sounds that the user otherwise would not be able to hear. Transduces those sounds into electrical stimuli that are delivered to the auditory nerve or the nerve that runs from the ear to the brain. And that allows these individuals who have damage to their inner ear to have some perception of sound, certainly they can follow conversations. This is a very successful example of a neuroprosthesis, restoring function to a damaged part of the nervous system. And what I want to tell you about today are our goals for a motor neuroprosthesis, or a neuroprosthetic device that would restore movement after injury to the spinal cord or the brain. In the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about some recent experiments we've done demonstrating that it's possible in an animal model to record activity from the brain, from individual neurons within the brain, and route that activity through computer hardware in order to control artificial stimulation delivered to a muscle and restore very simple movements about an otherwise paralyzed wrist. So it's just the first step in what we hope will be a technique that will allow individuals to regain control over their hands and arms and perhaps even their legs. In the second part of the talk today, I want to tell you a little bit about our first experiment stimulating electrically within the spinal cord. Most studies have focused on stimulating the muscles, which is technically easier to do, but it does have some problems that I'll tell you about. Stimulating within the spinal cord seems to be a powerful way to evoke very complex movements, very functional movements like reaching and grasping with very few stimulating electrodes. So we think this might be a promising approach if we're going to derive signals from the brain and use them to reanimate or to restore movements to these limbs. But I want to begin with the brain control of muscle stimulation. So this drawing shows an idealized system. We're not here yet. This is where we hope to be in 5, 10, 15 years. Electrical activity can be recorded from the brain, from the sensors that are surgically implanted. That activity can then be transduced through a series of small computer chips, either worn on the body or implanted under the skin, to control the timing of electrical stimulation delivered throughout the hand and arm. 
to restore reaching and grasping movements, functional tasks, activities of daily living, things like that. And so what I want to tell you about today is our initial demonstration that one or two neurons in the brain can be used to control stimulation of one or two muscle groups and restore movement to the wrist. But before I do that, I want to give you a brief overview of the field of brain-computer interfaces, which is where this falls within. Anytime you take activity from the brain and route it through a computer, that's known as a brain-computer interface. So I want to tell you about some of the history of that field and some of the other work going on across the country, uh, both in animal models and also uh, recent clinical trials. And so a typical target for um, brain-computer interfaces is to place electrodes in or near what's known as the motor cortex. There's a strip of brain just in front of the middle of your brain. If you wear a headband, it would fall just right about where that headband goes. And that strip of cortex is responsible for controlling the movements of your legs, your arms, your face, and your hand. And there's a very nice what we call somatotopic or body-shaped map where the size of the area in this diagram here and also in this claymation figure on the right represents the size of the brain devoted to those tasks. So you can see here that we have very dexterous control over our hands and fingers and the size of the brain devoted to that region is very large, making it an easy target for placing recording electrodes. Even some of the studies I tell you about that don't place electrodes within the brain but place them on the surface or on the surface of the scalp also often find the greatest control from areas over this motor cortex. So there's a couple different ways you can use a brain-computer interface, ranging from non-invasive or just wearing a cap of electrodes on the surface of your head. Shown here, this is known as electroencephalography, or EEG. EEG is, uh, there's in this case, about 64 sensors just placed on the hair, right under the hair. Um, it's, it provides some level of control, but the analogy I like to use is that EEG is like listening to this lecture from outside the building. The signal, my voice, the visual signals are filtered by passing through the skull, the skin, subcutaneous tissue. So you can tell that the lights are on in the room and you can probably tell that something's going on, maybe what the topic is, but you don't get a lot of information from EEG. You can take one step closer to the brain and use a technique called electrocorticography or ECOG for short, ECOG. Now ECOG is currently used to diagnose patients with intractable epilepsy. Certain patients will have seizures that can't be cured by other methods. The neurosurgeon wants to go and remove the tumor in order to figure out where the tumor is or where the focus of the epilepsy is that's, that's beginning these seizures. They'll record for about a week or two. They'll do surgery, place these electrodes on the surface of the brain and, do or and, and monitor for about two weeks. During that time, it gives some of the research, and there's, there's individuals here at University of Washington doing these studies, we have time to record from these electrodes and figure out whether they can be used in a brain-computer interface. And there's nice examples of individuals being able to control um, a robotic arm or robotic hand and simple movements like opening and closing of the fingers, moving computer cursors on the screen, things like that. ECOG, I like to say, is like listening to the activity of my brain, listening to this lecture from outside the door if the door were closed. You can hear the words, you can kind of you know, make out the tone, but you don't get all the information that you get if you actually go and put electrodes into the brain. And the great thing about the brain is there are no sensory neurons at all. Once you get through the scalp and the skull, you can actually, patients can be awake during these surgeries, you can't feel these electrodes penetrating the brain, there's no sensation within the surface of the brain, the brain parenchyma. And recently, and I'll tell you about this, they've actually implanted these electrodes in a small group of individuals with quadriplegia, well, some individuals with brainstem stroke, so individuals who are severely paralyzed by those uh, neurologic incidents. Now we can record the activity of individual neurons, the real information that the brain is using to communicate between one neuron and another neuron, or a group of cells or neurons, another group of cells, neurons. I'll use those words interchangeably. And with this, both in animal models like monkeys as well as recent human trials, we can actually now control a reaching and grasping movement for a robot, can control movements on a computer screen in multiple dimensions and like I'll show you later, very simple movements uh, of stimulation induced, stimulation induced movements of the wrist. So a little bit of history, the field of brain computer interfaces really began a little over 40 years ago 
right here at the University of Washington. Eberhard Fetz was a, was a new faculty member here. Working with monkeys, you're looking over the shoulder of a monkey. Eb didn't have computers back in 1969, so he used an analog meter arm. And what he would do is record the timing of neuron action potentials. You'll see a lot of plots like this. Every little vertical hash here is the time that a neuron fires. And if you put an electrode near a neuron, you see this electrical signal, this spike we call it, this big rapid pulse every time the neuron discharges an action potential. So Ebb used a very simple analog circuit, a Schmidt trigger with an integrator, to integrate the times that these neurons fired and create a signal to drive the meter arm back and forth. And the monkeys very rapidly learn to make the neuron discharge rapidly in order to get a reward. And the reward in this case was a fruit juice reward or an applesauce reward. So here's an example of the kind of controls that the monkeys had. Here's two different neurons denoted by their wave shape, and we split them out and color code them. The large unit in red, the small unit in blue. This shows the monkey working for about 75 minutes over an experiment. And the monkey is rewarded first for increasing the activity of the blue cell. And you see here from baseline rates of about 18 or so pulses per second, he's able to double that rate very rapidly. A short time later, he's rewarded for increasing the red cell, and he's able to do that as well. Later on in the trial, he decreases only the red cell, leaves the blue cell at its baseline rate. So fairly impressive examples of a brain-computer interface, given that it would be another 10 or 20 years until the personal computer was even sort of imagined or invented. And the field of brain-computer interfaces really had to wait about two or three decades for a couple things to happen, for the electrodes that we put in the brain to become better, for the computers to become fast enough to make it a viable clinical treatment, to make it worth doing a clinical trial and surgically implanting these electrodes. And so just before 2006, Lee Hochberg and John Donahue, who are now at Brown University, Mass General in Boston, did a very small study with four or five individuals with quadriplegia where they implanted these 100 electrode arrays. They're only four millimeters on a side. This shows one on the surface of a penny here. So it's a very small array. It only penetrates about a millimeter, millimeter and a half into the brain. And here it's shown placed in motor cortex, right in the knob that represents the hand area of motor cortex. This was a really important study because it demonstrated that individuals, even several years after um, a complete, I think this was uh, C4 uh, tetraplegia, even after complete injury, individuals still were able to control or modulate the activity of the neurons in their brain. You can imagine individuals who are uh, deaf or blind, often that part of the brain becomes co-opted for other uses. So no one was sure before this study whether the motor areas would be co-opted for another uh, modality. Turns out they were not. And this individual was able to learn by imagining movements or attempting to move, to move a cursor on a computer screen, which I'll show you here in this video clip, and also to open and close a prosthetic, a simple prosthetic robotic hand. So the video I'm going to show you next the blue dot on the screen is under control of this individual's brain. There's about 30 different neurons that are contributing to moving this dot on the screen, just like if you were moving a mouse uh, with your hand, moving a cursor with a mouse. And the game that this individual is playing is to, is to hit the, the money bags and the animals and the things that make happy sounds and to avoid the things that make evil laughs and, and evil villains. It's sort of a silly game, but what you'll see from the game is you'll get a sense of the control. It's by no means perfect, but he can often avoid the places he's supposed to and go to the places that he wants to go. Hopefully you'll hear the audio as well. So I hope you can see from that that certainly it's not as smoothly as, as uh, some of us could move a mouse um, on a computer screen, but it's pretty good. He's getting to the goals that he wants to get to most of the time. And you can see he's clearly very motivated. He gets a little frustrated there when he makes two mistakes in a row. Uh, but with this program, he could also open emails and, and visit certain websites and things by, by driving the mouse to places he wanted to. So certainly very 
uh, liberating experience for an individual who's otherwise paralyzed. Uh, this other example I just want to show you, it's a fairly simple example. You'll hear him narrating whether he wants to open or close the hand. Uh, this was actually done with, I believe, only one or two neurons. And so you'll see this is a robotic hand placed in his lap. And they're using, again, brain activity to dictate whether he would like the hand to be open or closed. So a first step, perhaps, in a robotic prosthesis. It's a little bit hard to hear him through the, through the endotrach tube there. But. So fairly inspiring examples, I think. This is the state of the art. John and his group are going on to do more patients now, but fairly slowly. These procedures are not something that anyone takes lightly. Certainly neurosurgery to put electrodes in the brain is a serious procedure, only worth it if the benefits outweigh the risks, of course. In animal experiments, we can implant larger numbers of electrode arrays and, and actually provide more practice to the animals. And that's some of the studies I'll tell you about. But I want to tell you about Andy Schwartz's group and Melville East at the University of Pittsburgh. We did a study with a monkey where they implanted the same kind of electrode array in the brain, the 100 electrode array, implanted here, and then trained the monkey over a series of many months to control the movement of a robotic exoskeleton or a robotic arm that could reach out, grab food, bring it back, and feed the monkey all under the monkey's control. And to do that, they used the activity of about 100 different neurons, and each colored arrow here represents what I'm going to call the preferred direction, or the direction where that neuron seems to want the arm to go. And I'll explain that more in a couple of slides. But you can find neurons in the brain that fire strongly when an individual moves in one direction, another neuron which fires strongly when an individual moves in another direction. So this video shows the monkey controlling. There's no audio on this one. Uh, this video shows the monkey uh, here, the electrode arrays implanted in his brain. He's controlling the movement of this arm to try to reach for the slice of cucumber grasping the cucumber and then bringing it back to his mouth. So again, very impressive. You can see, of course, the control is not nearly as smooth, perhaps, as, a, as an able-bodied individual would do, but um, definitely able to accomplish the goal of self-feeding, which I think is, is certainly a viable uh, clinical goal. They do a few tricks with this. They freeze the arm while he's grabbing the, the cucumber and just operate the gripper. Then they freeze the arm again while he's eating it to keep himself from bumping himself in the nose. So, there's a couple of algorithmic things going on in the background, but overall, I think fairly impressive control. But even with all these impressive examples, the control is not near perfect, and probably not even quite good enough to send this home with someone unsupervised. And part of the reason is, when we're trying to predict where the robotic arm should go, or where the computer cursor should go, we never quite get it right. If this is the R-squared prediction of accuracy, where this is 80% of the time we're getting it right, you can see that the graphs stop at 80% and really no lines get above about 80%. So we're getting it right four out of five times. That's pretty good. Um, but it doesn't seem to improve to add more neurons. This plot shows how many neurons we use and how well we do predicting it. And up to about 60 neurons, you can see we plateau, we asymptote here around 60 to 80%. And as we drop neurons randomly back, we really don't start to degrade performance a lot until we're below 10 or 20 neurons. So the solution, I don't think, is to put more electrodes in and try to record more neurons. I'll argue the solution is to try to train the neurons that you have with some kind of practice so that those neurons you have get a lot better. And that's what we set out to do a couple of years ago. So we revived the use of biofeedback, even though it's not clinically popular anymore, in order to train individual neurons and pairs of neurons to be controlled by a monkey, initially to move a cursor on a computer screen. And I'll show you some examples of that and later to control stimulation of an otherwise paralyzed arm, a temporarily paralyzed arm. And so what we did here is we first recorded neurons while the monkey just moved his hand around to play a simple computer game where he moves the small box into the larger boxes to get an applesauce reward. Then we switched so that the small box was controlled by the neuron itself. The spike train shown here smoothed to a continuous signal driving the computer cursor, the, the box on the screen back and forth. And then, once we'd done that, we let the monkey practice with this before we switched to control muscle stimulation. So I want to show you an example of each one of these steps so that you have an intuitive feel for the experiments. 
and sort of what the limits of control are of even a single neuron or individual pairs of neurons. So this first animation shows the monkey playing the video game with his hand as if this were a joystick. He's producing torque or force about his wrist to move this little box into one of eight targets around the outside. And while he's doing that, we're eavesdropping on his brain. We're listening to the spike times, the sounds of an individual neuron discharging action potentials. And those are the popping sounds that you'll hear on the speaker. So what I want you guys to try to figure out is which direction on this screen this particular neuron prefers. It fires more spikes, it fires faster popping sounds in some directions than in others. And that gives us information about how to proceed with the experiment. Does anybody have a guess about which direction this neuron preferred? About which direction? Sort of left? Your left or my left? Up, up high? Your left? Sort of in here? Okay. The screen right was sort of, sort of up into the screen right. Was sort of where I would. That's where I would say. We can listen to it again later. Oh, right, so you're answering the opposite of the question I asked, which is great. So preferred for me means where it fires more activity, and you picked up very intuitively where it fired less. So absolutely, so you guys are both correct. So it fires more activity in this direction. It fires less activity over here. So these are simple raster plots where we add up how many times the neuron fired during each target, where the light blue turquoise shading here is the time where he's within each target. And then we can summarize that activity in this compass plot in the middle where the directions, the length of the arrows sort of summarize how much activity there is. So very quiet over here on the left and firing more rapidly on the right. And so we're going to call movements to the right the preferred direction. happens to be extension of this animal's wrist because he's playing with his right hand. And if we use that information, we can now create the first brain control task, the brain computer interface task for this neuron. And we'll do something very simple. We'll place a target on the right, which represents high firing rates of the cell, lots of spikes. A target on the left, which represents low firing rates. And then we'll reduce the game briefly to just one dimension. So the cursor moving back and forth, controlled directly by the neuron. The hand has nothing to do with it. And the monkey's task is now the hand's just hanging out. And he's taking his brain activity to drive the small box into one of these two cursors. So this is the same cell. This is about three minutes after the video clip you just saw. So pay attention to how fast the cell fires, how long he's able to sustain that fast firing rate or that slow firing rate. Hopefully from that short clip you have some appreciation for the ability that the monkey can increase the rate of the cell, hold it there for several seconds, decrease the rate of the cell, hold it there for several seconds. And I think in a fairly impressive control for an individual neuron in the brain. And this graph summarizes some of the experiments we did with several different groups of cells. Standard experiment was to ask the monkey to hold the target for one second. The example you just saw, he held the target for two seconds, which is this middle panel here. In some neurons, we asked him to hold the target for three seconds, which is a long time in, in brain land. So maintaining cell rate for three seconds is a very long time. Typically, these neurons communicate in short, rapid bursts. And with some, a subset of cells, the monkey was able to maintain high discharge rates here or low discharge rates for up to three seconds. The monkeys also learned fairly rapidly to increase the rate. You probably heard that the rate was faster in the second clip in the brain control than it was in the first clip. And here, just over about 12 minutes, this monkey's learning to increase the rate of the cell to nearly double the beginning from about 30 to just short of 60. 
um, as we move the target, the blue target, progressively farther away. So the monkey's learning to change the modulation, we call it, or how much the rate is changing. He's learning to hold it for long periods of time. And with improved electrode technology that we now have, we can actually record the same neuron, sometimes for many days. Here shows the same neuron practicing across eight different days. The monkey at the first day is not so good. He's only getting about five targets per minute. That's this axis here. Five targets per minute is painfully slow to watch. But after a couple of days, the monkey is getting four times as many targets in a minute. He's getting about 16 targets per minute, which is about as fast as he can go at this particular task, given that we give him a reward in between each target. About uh, 27 of the 36 cells that we tested across a bunch of days show this nice improvement. They improved from the first day to this one of the subsequent days. Only a couple cells get worse. So there's definitely a chance for practice, for biofeedback, uh, to improve the ability to control these cells. And I wanted to show you quickly what it looks like when only two neurons controlled at the same time control a cursor. Just so that you can compare it to the video you saw of the human subject where he was using about 30 neurons. In this case, one neuron controls the movement of this solid box back and forth, just like it did before. A second neuron controls the movement up and down. And you'll hear the sound of the two neurons as slightly different pitches on the audio track. Certainly not nearly perfect control, but not a far cry from what you can do with 30 or 40 or 100 neurons. So sort of giving some credence to the idea that perhaps training two neurons, or four neurons, or six neurons might be just as good or perhaps better than training 20 all at once. The other groups just throw all 20 on there and let you figure it out. So we're trying to build up from a smaller subset. But all the examples I've shown you so far are using the brain to control external devices. And the highest priority for paralyzed individuals, at least from the survey studies that I've seen, is regaining use of their own limbs. Certainly, at least for quadriplegic patients in the Kim Anderson study from 2004, regaining hand and arm function was by far the most important. So rather than controlling a robotic device or cursors on a computer screen, which are certainly useful, perhaps our goal should be to try to restore movement to the limbs. And so we set out to do this about four or five years ago now, trying to merge two very well-established fields. As I've just shown you, many studies have demonstrated that brain-computer interfaces can be used to drive cursors and robotic arms. Previously, separate studies of functional electrical stimulation, or FES, have shown that individuals with certain types of paresis or paralysis can have stimulating electrodes either placed on the skin or placed under the skin to activate muscles. And this is Hunter Peckham's freehand system. It's clinically available typically used for individuals with a distal paresis or paralysis of the hand but not the shoulder. These individuals, by moving their shoulder, often on the opposite side, can trigger a stimulator to open or close the hand. Very, uh, the typical, typically used for stroke patients. Um, not widely available, but definitely clinically available. So our goal was to merge these two fields, to extract control signals from the brain about what the monkey wanted to do, use those signals to control electrical stimulation to make the limb move, in those patterns. And to do this, we began the same way that I've been telling you, by recording activity from the brain, first practicing on the computer screen, and then routing that activity through the simplest computer transform we could come up with to control FES, or functional electrical stimulation, of these uh, muscles. Now, to do this experiment, we had to develop a method to temporarily paralyze the arm. We don't want to produce spinal cord injuries in our monkeys. These animals are very valuable to us. But we do want to temporarily and reversibly paralyze the arm so that we can test the level of control. And I have to spend at least a slide on this because it turned out that creating the model of reversible paralysis, the experimental model, was actually more difficult than reanimating the limb. 
So we spent several years trying to develop a method to uh, non-painfully inject anesthetic near the nerves, and this is the shoulder area, what we call the brachial plexus, the pectoralis shown, we didn't reflect it, but it's just shown reflected here in the image. Um, these are the median, ulnar, and radial nerves that run down from the shoulder into the arm. So we developed a method where we placed cuffs around the nerves, actually ended up being catheters sewn into the epineurium, the sheath around the nerve, so that we could painlessly inject lidocaine, which is like Novocaine when you go to the dentist, or chloroprocaine, faster acting derivative. Uh, without the acidic components, there was no burning. And we would inject that uh, during the experiment. So that for about two or three hours, the monkey's arm became numb and paralyzed. And the only way for him to move his arm was to use his brain activity through our computer system. This just shows an example of how the nerve block worked. We inject lidocaine or chloroprocaine here at minute zero and also at minute 10. And this is just a plot of how much torque or how much force the monkey can generate about his wrist. And you see that dropping over this 15, 20 minute period. During that time, we're letting him play the brain-computer interface game so that he has something to do while his arm is gradually becoming numb. And he's able to maintain the activity of the brain cell here in the first, middle, and last third of this period just the same regardless of the fact that his arm is slowly becoming numb. Once the monkey is paralyzed, then we can connect the brain activity to stimulate the muscle. And so this animation first shows the brain activity recorded here, uh, shown by this red ball, just going to control the computer screen. We've seen several examples of that already. And then later, we used computer hardware, either our neurochip shown here, which I'll tell you about more in a second, or just a regular set of computers, to convert the activity from the brain into stimuli delivered here to the wrist muscles. Now the monkey's task is to guide the small box into the larger one when his wrist is otherwise paralyzed. And the only way to do it is to use the computer circuit. So I want to show you some examples of the level of control that was attained by the monkeys. One of our monkeys was able to produce five different levels of torque or force about his wrist. A center target shown in gray, which required no torque, no force. And two levels of flexion shown as various shades of blue. Two levels of extension as various shades of red. And he did this very rapidly over about a 12-minute period shown here, where he moved between targets that were randomly presented on the screen back and forth in a manner like this. And to get to each target, he had to produce a different amount of activity with the cell in order to trigger the muscle stimulator appropriately, either a flexor stimulator or an extensor stimulator. And I'll show you the details on the next slide. But I, before we leave here, I want you to notice that every 10 minutes, we would turn the stimulators off, and we would make sure that the monkey was still paralyzed, that he wasn't able to cheat by using some activity as he recovered from the nerve block. And the very thin red and blue lines shown here within the gray bars demonstrate the amount of torque or force that he could produce without the stimulator. So this is the maximum amount. It's only about 5 to 10 percent of where these near targets are. This is the maximum amount he could do by himself. Everything else above or below those lines is done with the stimulator. <clears throat> For the techies in the audience, here's the detail of how we convert cell activity shown by these vertical hash marks across the bottom into wrist torque shown across the top to acquire the five different levels of torque. We take the cell activity, we smooth it with a very simple sliding window, and then we impose some thresholds, like an extensor threshold shown in red, a flexor threshold shown in blue. When the cell rate falls below one of the thresholds, the extensor threshold here, we stimulate the extensor muscles in direct proportion to the cell rate below the threshold, and that's shown by the stimulus amplitude here. That results in an extensor torque or extensor movement of the wrist. When the cell fires quickly, shown in the middle here, the average activity goes above the blue threshold, the flexor threshold, and we stimulate the flexors here, shown in blue, in direct proportion to the cell rate. That causes the wrist to flex and acquire the near or far flexor target. In this example, the monkey used just one cell to control stimulation of flexors at high rates, extensors when the cell was at low rates. We also use two cells simultaneously to control the different muscle groups. So here, the same monkey is using the red cell, one cell, to control extensors, and another blue cell to control flexors. And now the cells are independent. Here he can burst cell one, stimulate his extensors shown in red, and acquire this target. Burst cell two in the middle, stimulate his flexors, acquire this target. Or keep both cells relatively quiet to hold a zero force or zero torque target in the middle. So certainly this level of control was impressive, but probably not quite clinically useful yet. 
But I think the most important thing we learned from this study, or the two most important things, one, performance improves with practice. So training these neurons, giving the monkey time to practice these neurons made a big difference. Performance either doubled or even tripled over very brief periods of practice, 20, 30 minutes of practice. Such that in the end, there was really no difference between how well the monkey did controlling cursors on the screen with controlling the stimulation of his muscle via FES. And the second most important thing we learned was that it didn't seem to matter what kind of neurons we chose for this control. At the beginning, I showed you a neuron that was directionally tuned. That particular neuron was tuned in this direction to the right. This example here is tuned in the flexor direction to the left. And we thought when we started this study that we would need to find neurons just like this, tune neurons and pair them with muscles in the same direction, and that's the only way that the experiment would work. And it just so happens that there's not so many tuned neurons. There's only about a third of them that you run into randomly that fall into this tuned category. The other two-thirds fall into this untuned category. And because we didn't have a lot of choices, on some days we tried the untuned neurons just to see what would happen. An untuned neuron is active, but you can't tell which direction it prefers. It doesn't give you any hints. So we tried a few of these neurons, which originally were not quite as good as the two neurons. The two neurons, on average and statistically, do better at the very beginning, right at the beginning of practice, than the untuned neurons. But over a pretty short period of time, about 10 or 20 minutes, the monkey will learn to use a good number of these untuned neurons just as well or even better than some of the tuned neurons. So the brain seems to be very capable of learning these new, these new paradigms, these new connections. And it turned out that, that after practice there was statistically no difference. You couldn't have predicted based on the neuron how well the monkey would have done. And the other nice thing about this finding is because most of the neurons are untuned, being able to use them really triples the population of, of cells, of neurons that you could use for this type of approach. It also gave us the idea that perhaps we don't need to be just within motor cortex of the side of the brain that typically controls the hand. Perhaps we could be in other areas like sensory cortex or maybe even in the opposite hemisphere if that brain area happened to be damaged by stroke or traumatic brain injury. And so very briefly we checked somatosensory cortex just behind the central sulcus here and found in a small sample that the monkeys did just as well as with uh, motor cortex. And we're now going on to do studies exploring other regions of the brain to see how those compare. But another thing that this study demonstrated is that we need practice. We need to practice with these novel neurons in order for them to become good. And what we're doing now in the lab is trying to reduce, this is a photo of our laboratory, we're trying to reduce the equipment in the laboratory, which is about five computers and a whole bunch of stimulators and recording amplifiers, we're trying to reduce that to something that's about pocket size. It's about the size of a cellular phone. And we have a prototype of what we call the neurochip. This is about the size of a cell phone, the circuits that go inside a small cell phone. And this device is capable of recording, stimulating, running for 24 hours at a time. So far, it would be worn in a shirt pocket or, or in, a, in, a, in a hat on the head. But we're able to now replicate these experiments. Everything I showed you so far was done here with a bunch of computers. We're able to replicate these experiments and hopefully provide the animals and eventually human subjects with longer practice times, continuous practice using these devices. So the neurochip's capable of recording from one or more electrodes placed in the brain or elsewhere, in real time transforming that signal into stimulation delivered either to other parts in the brain, the spinal cord, which I'll tell you about in a moment, or in the muscles, which we've been talking about. It can do what's called discriminating the action potential, taking that waveform shape and picking out the timing storing that information to onboard memory, onboard flash memory. And when connected to a battery and enclosed in a little titanium hat, which the monkeys can wear, it can operate autonomously for over 24 hours and keep these stimulating circuits active. So the brain has time to learn these new connections that we've imposed. We've demonstrated that uh, the neurochip in the very simple case is capable of detecting cell activity and triggering a train of stimulation in order to produce sort of simple stereotype movements of the wrist. And we're now, of course, working on the nerve block again, because that's always the hardest part. And now we need to create temporary reversible paralysis, but for 24-hour periods or longer. So we can study this uh, neuroprosthetic approach all day and all night. And to do that, we're implanting ampules filled with tetrodotoxin, which is a very pow uh, powerful sodium channel blocker. So it seems that when we actually connect this to the monkey, the monkeys learn like that. And then we spend a year or two developing the method so that we can yet again let the monkey try it out. 
But once we, let, once we put the brain in the loop, it seems like the brain learns very rapidly to incorporate these new connections. So I want to spend the rest of the talk, and it's much shorter than the first part, I want to spend the remaining time talking about stimulating within the spinal cord now, not stimulating in the muscles. There's several advantages to stimulating in the spinal cord. Advantages that might make it one of the best opportunities for recording from the brain and delivering stimulation. And so I'll tell you about why it's better, and then I'll show you some of our initial examples of evoking hand and arm movements, again from the monkey model, uh, by stimulating in the cervical spinal cord. So stimulating the spinal cord is really developed by Vivian Mouchoir, who's now at the University of Alberta. Oh, during her PhD thesis in the, in the late 1990s, uh, 98 or so, and then she's continuing to work on this. And she's actually, I'll tell you at the end, about to do the first clinical trial in, um, in humans with spinal cord injury, in the lumbar, uh, implanting in the lumbar spinal cord. And I'll show you some examples of how she does her implants. But one of the advantages of spinal stimulation compared to muscle stimulation it's much less likely to fatigue the muscles. You've probably heard that FES, or functional electrical stimulation, leads to rapid muscle fatigue, sometimes leads to more jerky force, and that's because it turns on the parts of the muscle in a backwards order. We call this recruitment order, is the fancy term. If you recruit your muscles in the right order, you get the small fatigue-resistant groups first, and then the fast, not fatigue-resistant groups later. That's what happens when you stimulate a muscle, you get the opposite. You get the big fatigable ones first. It's a high force, kind of jerky, but it wears out very quickly in just even a couple of seconds. Stimulating the spinal cord gives us a more natural recruitment, a more graded recruitment of these motor units. It leads to less fatigue and more steady forces. The other very nice thing about spinal stimulation is that from single electrodes placed within the spinal cord, you can activate many muscles and often muscles in functional patterns at, like you would want to activate, grasping muscles, for example, muscles that help the leg to stand. And Vivian showed very nicely in her cat studies about 10 years ago now that with just four electrodes placed in the spinal cord, two electrodes on each side, so two electrodes per leg, she could get the cat to step with its hind limbs. One electrode would activate all the muscles needed to support weight for stance, the quadriceps, the gastrocnemius, all the muscles all the way down the leg. Another electrode on that side, all the muscles to lift the leg up and swing it forward. So a very elegant system. If we were to do this with muscle stimulation, we would need 5, 10, 20 different electrodes per leg. And then we'd have to coordinate all those to say, this muscle and this muscle come on together and then these two. So we seem to be able to tap into some circuits, some networks in the spinal cord, which simplify the control greatly. And I'll show you that that's also true. This is all from the lumbar spinal cord, trying to restore movement to the lower limbs. I'll show you it's also true for the cervical spinal cord. So recently we set out to determine what kind of movements we could evoke in the hand and the arm from the cervical spinal cord of monkeys. And this video shows an example of the monkey's hand moving in a very functional pattern, a finger to thumb grasp. And the audio you'll hear now is not the sound of neurons, just the sound of our stimulator. So you'll hear brief twitches of the stimulator, and then you'll hear longer trains, and you'll see the difference in how much the hand moves. So at the end, that's essentially continuous stimulation. Our stimulator had to cycle over, which is why you hear the sound change just a little bit. But a very nice functional movement. This is just a single electrode in the spinal cord activating about eight or ten muscles, all in a nice functional pattern. And we map the spinal cord just with um, traditional movable electrodes. I'll show you now we're implanting uh, more chronic electrodes. We drive an electrode down through the spinal cord, and we explore the kind of movements that we get in different positions. So if we zoom in here just on the right half of the spinal cord, we can see here the gray outlines show where we tracked with our electrode. The gray matter, the cell bodies are shown by the inner outline. The whole spinal cord is shown by the outer outline. This is the central canal here. This little circle corresponds to that point there. And the colored dots denote the different kind of movements from this library of about 20 different movements that we saw. And you'll see that on some tracks, we get things like thumb flexion and finger flexion shown in light and dark blue, like we saw in the video. 
On other pathways for the electrode or other sites in the spinal cord, we see things like wrist, elbow, and shoulder shown in the orange and red, sort of clustered out here. This is just one example area of the spinal cord. If we expand that out into three dimensions, we see the kind of organization that we observe. Around C7, C8, we see more uh, upper, upper arm, elbow, and shoulder movements shown by the red colors. And really throughout the spinal cord, we see a lot of finger and thumb. It's fairly easy to evoke finger and thumb movements. And really at over three quarters of the sites that we tried to stimulate, we got some movement of the arm or hand. So it's fairly easy to evoke it, not always easy to predict where you might find a given uh, movement, not as easy to predict as the lumbar cord, it turns out. But um, certainly the functional movements, movements of the thumb and the finger, the things we're most interested in, also occurred at the greatest number of sites. So that was very, comfort that was very comforting. We also observed these really nice functional synergy. So at a certain number of sites, at about a third of the sites, we always saw two movements or two muscle groups start at once. We weren't able to separate them. And that's shown by this plot here where the intersection of the grid shows the movement. For example, fingers and thumb, most common, the large purple bar here. Flexion and flexion of the fingers and thumb. And so at about a third of the sites, we get these nice muscle synergies, grasping, uh, wrist flexion, and elbow extension, sort of an extension pressing of the arm. Um, and so again, we're able to tap into these spinal circuits, we think, and activate multiple movements. We did a cluster analysis, which is just a mathematical way of looking at how different muscles group together. And so I've abbreviated the muscles here. I'll tell you what they mean in a second. But what we see is things that extend the wrist, extensor carpial nerus, extensor digitorum four and five, these two muscles that we measure that extend the fingers and wrist, cluster together. They come on together more often than any other muscle. Flexors of the fingers and wrist, flexor carpial nerus, digitorum superficialis, and palmaris longus cluster together, the flexors of the hand and the wrist. Biceps and triceps, the two muscles in the upper arm group together. And first dorsal interosseus, the muscle that forms the web between your finger and your thumb, responsible for this movement here. Uh, it's really the only muscle in the hand that we could measure, and it's separate from all these other groups. So it shows some nice anatomical organization of spinal stimulation. So I just want to summarize briefly the spinal stimulation part, and then we'll talk more broadly. Uh, we found that hand and arm movements were readily evoked throughout the cervical spinal cord at over three quarters of the sites that we tried. And that muscles were often co-activated, commonly co-activated, in what we would call functional synergies or useful patterns. And based on our study and, and really a career's worth of work by Vivian Mushawar, uh, she and a neurosurgeon colleague at the University of Calgary are ramping up for the first human trial implanting these kind of electrodes in the lumbar spine. And so I want to show you how they do it. It's a technique that I learned from her. We're now doing it in our, uh, some of our other animal models. Um, but it's a really, a really brilliant technique. So if you watch this animation here, you'll see it zoom in on the lumbar spinal cord. And the way they implant the electrodes is by removing a small bit of bone here, and then the electrodes come in, are anchored to a dorsal process, and then are implanted there, these little black wires, implanted like little tiny forks down into the spinal cord. And these are, the wires are about 30 microns in diameter, about half the thickness of a human hair. And she puts in somewhere between 5 and 20 different wires on each side of the spinal cord. And that allows her to evoke these very functional movements of the hind limbs. So in the next couple of years, they're going to do the first very small clinical trial on this, uh, up at probably at the University of Calgary, the medical center there. So in the meantime, we have just a couple of other projects I want to make you aware of, and then I'll wrap up. We are also, of course, looking at using cortical activity, brain activity, to trigger spinal stimulation. The fact that we could use fewer control signals, fewer stimulating electrodes, may make spinal stimulation really the ideal application for using a small number of brain cells, like I showed you in the beginning. Perhaps even with a handful of brain cells, we could activate grasping and reaching, or something like that. So we're continuing to work on that. We are also working with Yoki Matsuyoka, who's here at the University of Washington, to use neurons recorded from the brain, small populations of neurons, to directly control robotic hands. And Yoki's developed a really brilliant, anatomically correct robotic hand. It's shown, a picture of it's shown here. It looks like a skeleton because the bones are modeled after the exact shape of human bones. The tendons and the tendon webs are modeled after the exact orientation of the humans. And she's developed controllers which can move these hands around in very dexterous patterns. The question is, is it the best application to record from small populations of neurons and hook them up directly to either individual muscle motors, they call them, on the hand, or individual movements, 
And would this be a way to reanimate movement either for a person with limb loss or a person with uh, severe paralysis? And so really going forward, um, that's, that's essentially what I talked about here, using individual neurons to control first the movement of just a finger and then eventually a whole hand to try to, um, to, try to recreate these movements. But going forward, we're really inspired by the work of Todd Kaiken and, and his colleagues at the Rehab Institute of Chicago who've worked with individuals with limb loss, double amputees like Jesse Sullivan here, to control robotic prostheses. And this is the type of control we hope to achieve within the next 5, 10, 15 years with brain control of muscle stimulation. And the way they do these studies, Todd sews the nerves that used to go to the arm after the amputation or during the amputation, he sews those nerves into a muscle like the pectoralis muscle in the chest. And once he sewed those nerves into the muscle, you can record just from the surface of the skin and record the electrical activity from the different parts of the nerves that used to lead to the hand and arm. Those signals can then be used to control the motors on this uh, robotic limb. So if, this is video is a few years old now, but if you haven't seen it yet, I think it demonstrates some impressive technology. And Jesse's narrating the, the movements. Shoulder up. Elbow straight. Elbow back, shoulder down, elbow down, bring that back around. Are you actively closing the hand or are you just not doing anything with the hand? I'm not doing anything with it. Press the hand. Kathy wants me to keep it closed. I'm going to open it. Keep it open. Okay. Elbow down, shoulder up, shoulder down. Got a little rotation in there. We're working on that. Elbow up. Take him in part way. Oh, great, Jesse. Wax on, wax off. Nice. Come on. Wax on. Paint the fence. That's it. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Set the floor. Set the floor. Which one? Set the floor. Where's the sand there? <laughs> anyway, I think that's sort of an inspiring example. Obviously, again, not perfect control, but certainly a goal, a functional goal. Uh, for all of us in the brain-computer interface field, this is not a brain-computer interface, this is a neural interface. Those of us in the brain-computer interface field to, to shoot towards. So I want to just summarize the points that I made this evening. Uh, we've demonstrated that monkeys can use really arbitrary neurons, tuned or untuned neurons, to control the activity of muscle stimulation and produce very simple movements, flexion and extension, of an otherwise paralyzed arm. And we're now asking the question, could long-term practice or bringing in additional non-native brain areas improve this control? I've also shown you that spinal stimulation is able to evoke a variety of hand and arm movements, in, as well as functional synergies. And the question is, is cortically controlled or brain controlled spinal stimulation maybe the ideal application for this neuroprosthetic in order to restore volitional control of movement to paralyzed limbs? So I'd like to thank the many students, mentors, collaborators, and of course funding agencies that make all this ongoing work possible. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your presentation tonight, Dr. Moritz. And yes, we do have time for questions. So, great question. So the question, if you couldn't hear it, was that um, the monkey learned to use uh, the neurons over 10 or 20 minutes a period. Did he have to start over fresh each day or was some of that skill retained? If we were able to keep the recording of the neuron, which is technically challenging to do, but if we had the same neuron on the next day on our electrode, the monkey got progressively better. And that's what you saw in one of the figures in the middle where he gets better on days one through eight. Often, unfortunately, and this is one of the challenges in the field, is recording stability, being able to hold the same neuron for multiple days. If the monkey had to start with a new neuron in the next day, he would often start a little bit worse. But there was a general knowledge that seemed to carry over. Once the monkey learned the routine, he could learn new neurons much more quickly than the very first neuron that he ever practiced with. So it was definitely general knowledge, and it seemed like if the neuron was still there, he would improve much more. He could, he could take what he used the day before and really pick up almost where he left off and improve on that. Great question. Thank you. What is the, um, the interface between the electrode and the neurological, biological part? What's the longevity of that uh, toxicity? Is there anything that can be done to encourage the interface, or does it diminish, degrade after time? Excellent question. So um, it's certainly it's a huge area of research. It is a foreign body. It's an artificial component that we're putting in the brain. And the brain likes to react to that. It likes to form scar tissue around it. 
No one has observed any toxicity per se, but just like if you've got a splinter under your skin, the body will react and, and form a little sheath of connective tissue around it. Over the course of time, even six months or a year, that scar tissue can cause the recordings, the electrical recordings, to become not as good. And so in the original clinical trial that John Donahue did, he actually only planned to leave the electrodes in for one year. Partly because we knew from the monkey studies that after about a year, the recordings were not nearly as good. Now there are many people working on it, and even now, John is leaving those electrodes in for up to three years and doing pretty well. There's, there's a gentleman here, Bill Shane, actually just moved here from Wadsworth. And he is working on exactly what you say, putting coatings on those electrodes to either decrease that reaction from the tissue, putting windows in the electrodes so that the body seems to see through it, and certainly um, technology like Buddy Ratner's technology here in bioengineering where he puts little micropores on the surface of, of, um, of implants, and those 30 micron pores aren't recognized by the immune system so that you don't get this inflammatory response. Things like that show promise. But to be honest, that's one of the huge barriers to a long-term clinical application. No one, I don't think, wants to sign up for brain surgery every year or every two years. Every five or ten years, if you've really got to move your arms again, maybe we're starting to get to the balance point. But certainly we need to improve the longevity. Certainly there are examples in animals where these electrodes last for six or more years. But they're few and far between. The typical case is two to three years. Um, but people are, a lot of smart people are working on it, and I think that it's a technical problem. I think it'll be solved in the next decade or so. Isn't it a bit soon to start a clinical trial when you're creating a situation of basically addicting a person to crack? You're starting them on something and giving them an ability they may never have, never have had since birth or haven't had in 10 or 20 years, and then they've got to realize that in a year they're going to lose it again. That's like starting all over again from scratch. How does that go over with people? Yeah, it's a great question. So I was not involved in this clinical trial, so I can't comment on the subject interactions. I'm sure as part of the consenting process that they were completely aware of the duration of the study. But certainly, uh, no one knew when they started the study whether it would be like addiction to crack, where it would work really well, or if it would be frustratingly slow or, or not work at all. So the people who signed up for it, I think, were sort of curious about whether this technology could even work. And, and interested in trying it out for themselves. But I absolutely agree with your point. I think, from personally, I think it's too early to start clinical trials for my experiments. I would not advocate implanting someone with electrodes, implanting them with muscle stimulators, knowing that the technology at this point is probably only going to last for several years. And um, John's study was really a pioneering study, perhaps needed to be done at the time, perhaps was a couple years early. Um, but someone needed to demonstrate, and, and certainly there were many willing participants who wanted to sign up, even for the one year, uh, that the, the, the approach was even feasible. So I absolutely sympathize with your point. I certainly personally would not want to sign up for an ability that I knew was going to be taken away a year later. So I can, I can definitely uh, sympathize with that. Most of what you've done has, has concentrated on, on, on the very uh, severe problem of obtaining some kind of a stimulus which could be used uh, to move a muscle group in one way or another. And in many ways, the, the data that you're going to get even under the best of circumstances is going to be relatively crude. And is anybody looking at control algorithms to take relatively crude data and generate smoother, more functional um, applications or stimulus uh, with some intelligence that is outside of the body. Absolutely. So certainly the videos that I showed of the robotic arm moving were done with a huge amount of algorithmic post-processing from the neural activity before the robotic arm ever moved. They were guiding the end point of the robotic arm rather than guiding the joint angles. They were using quite a bit of intelligence about where in space they were and where they should speed up and slow down and there was a lot of intelligence in terms of training that went into gradually giving the monkey more and more control over that arm and less and less of an automated routine. There are many people working on the sort of control of the prosthetic arm, the DARPA hand project, DARPA um, prosthetic project you may be familiar with. And there's actually a newer video of Jesse Sullivan that I showed right at the end where he's controlling individual fingers. It's quite impressive. Um, we are just starting to think about um, better algorithms to convert brain activity into muscle stimulation. There's some have been out there. Um, they don't take advantage of the latest computer processing speeds 
And so we have some projects in the works where we're starting to use things like optimal controllers to try to transform the intention to move into the actual complex signals, which could compensate perhaps for some of these fatigue and nonlinearity uh, situations that you would see in the muscle. But yeah, there's a lot of really smart engineers and computer programmers involved both in, in my work and then, of course, across the country at many different labs that are, uh, that are trying to use, like you say, intelligence outside the body to smooth that over. But I should make the point that we think you can actually over-engineer the system. I mean, it may have been done already that you can actually try to make it too smart and not give the brain enough control. If your brain is intact, you have probably the best learning machine and the fastest processor that currently exists. So if we're actually able to extract high fidelity information from the brain, I would wager that, I would put my bets on the brain. I would say the brain will learn faster than an algorithm. If your information is crude, which it certainly is at this point, and you're undersampling and you're estimating, then absolutely you need some intelligence in the stream. It's a great question. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm curious about this clinical trial that you were talking about. The, it's, uh, the implants are in the lumbar spine. They are. And uh, um, it seems why, what's, what's the outcome or what's, what's the reason for working with the lumbar spine as opposed to the cervical spine? I mean, you know, I mean it's going to be the legs and not the Absolutely. hands. Absolutely. So I kind of brushed over that because my talk focuses on the upper extremity, but I wanted to certainly make people aware of the lower extremity work as well. Uh, many people have worked on functional electrical stimulation of the legs in order to restore gait, perhaps, with a walker. Uh, and there were, there were successes, actually, even 20, 30 years ago. The, the successes seemed to sort of come and go with the technology. Um, the goal with the lumbar implant is to restore stepping movements, also restore some sort of postural change in order to uh, reduce the, the occurrence of pressure ulcers and things like that. Um, I'd encourage you to contact Vivian. If you're interested in more information, to contact Vivian Mouchoir and University of Edmonton. I'm sure she can tell you. Uh, University of Alberta at Edmonton. I'm sure she can tell you more about the logic behind the study. But my understanding is that it, the goal is to see whether you can produce stepping movements in a human who has a spinal cord injury. I think that's the, that's the overall goal. And I could give a whole other talk about lower extremity paralysis and the various techniques that are, that are, being, tried, that are tried, being tried there, but it's a bit out of place in the talk today. Some of these efforts also look like they're almost turbocharged biofeedback uh, efforts uh, and I tried it uh, 25, 28 years ago when I was hurt and it, w it was rudimenta rudimentary at the time but I knew I had some latent tracks and I'm incomplete enough. Mm -hmm. I, I could perceive that I was, there was some activity but it w we couldn't discern it with motion. Right. So it seems that if you can boost the, the amplitude of the signal that is coming from the brain mm -hmm. and kind of submit that signal to your desired target that you'd get that feedback and eventually you wouldn't need it. So it would just be a, a learning assist to yes. get up to a level of potential. Absolutely. So I have a whole other talk on that as well, which I didn't include because it's completely in the works, but we're actually working on kind of what you said, trying to create an in, uh, a temporary circuit between the brain and the muscles in order to retrain those latent tracks, those those spared pathways, if you will, to, to do the job, and then perhaps that system can go away. But it's a very early stage as we don't yet know if the concept's going to work. We're, we're pairing it also with stem cell therapies, trying to see if the two will interact positively. Um, on the topic of biofeedback, though, I absolutely agree. Brain-computer interfaces really is sort of a rehash of biofeedback with a lot newer and better technology, and, and perhaps a slightly different goal, bypassing injury maybe rather than retraining it. We are also working on, it is almost exactly biofeedback, a clinical study that we do typically more with children with cerebral palsy, adults post-stroke or TBI, are actually interested in expanding that to the spinal cord injured population, uh, where we do try to retrain latent tracks with enhanced visual feedback, working through engaging computer games, trying to release dopamine, things like that that we think can increase neuroplasticity. So I'd love to talk to you actually about your, your previous experiences because we could learn a lot about what's been done already and, 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 and what worked and what didn't. Have you noticed that there would be any um, sensitivity or decreased sensitivity on the part that's receiving the signals from the stimulator itself? That's certainly the fatigue we notice in, in stimulation. Uh, are, you, are you talking about more long-term? Yeah, long-term. Long-term like scarring, there is... Just more and receive de a stronger depending signal. On, yeah, depending on how the electrical mm -hmm. stimulation is delivered, whether it's patches on the skin, which could be replaced. I don't think you'd see the problem there. Wires sewn into the muscle, 
surgically, there's some scarring. You do need to increase the current amplitude slightly over time. Um, and then there's other techniques where the wires are inserted through the skin for several weeks or a month and then removed and then they can be moved to a new position and that overcomes some of that problem. But certainly any time you put a foreign body uh, or you know, a foreign object inside the body, unless you have a lot of good tricks with immunosuppressives and pharmacology and things, the body's going to react to that, encapsulate it at least mildly in scar tissue and that's going to increase the, the difficulty of either recording a signal or passing a stimulus current. The nice thing about stimulation is you can usually turn up the intensity and overcome that. Recording is so sensitive that when there's a big wall of scar tissue, it's, it becomes less like sitting in the room here and more like being pushed out the door and then eventually out into the outside of the building. You, you get farther and farther from that neuron and there's not much you can do to turn up the volume and listen to it. So I'd like to once again thank Dr. Moritz for uh, his excellent presentation this evening. Thank you.